Ladies and gentlemen, we are back live now into the third hour. Nomi Prinz is going to be our guest. And Nomi Prinz is an independent journalist and author and speaker. And I'm not going to go through all of her different degrees and background, but she was a managing director at Goldman Sachs over some key areas uh, that uh, she thought was going to cause a major problem and basically quit over it. And I guess you could call it really a whistleblower. She's written a bunch of best-selling books. She's got a new book coming out very, very soon as well. We'll talk some about, but nomiprins.com. And we have links to that up on infowars.com. Uh, obviously, uh, I want to get into the announcement that there'll be no criminal charges two years later on uh, Don Corzine of MF Global. I want to get into the bond market, all your inside take on that. But uh, for new listeners out there, we have a lot of new stations and, and new folks tuning in every millisecond. Tell people a little bit about yourself, your awakening, what you've witnessed, and what this general system is, and why you decided to get out of it. Was it a decade ago? Yeah, over a decade now. Um, yeah, I had been in international banking for over a decade, actually. I, I had been at Lehman Brothers. I had been at Bear Stearns in London for seven years. And then uh, my final stop was Goldman Sachs, where I was only for less than two years and just had to get out because it was just such a... A horrible environment around the time when Enron was imploding and WorldCom was imploding and this whole idea, which later imploded the rest of the economy of credit derivatives and CDOs and all these esoteric things that had to do with um, horrible loans, bonds that were going to default, companies that were going to default, were really coming to the head of the company and, and Wall Street in general. And, and I read your book that came out, what, in 2006 or so? 2004. Uh, 2004. Yeah. Uh, I guess I read 2006, where yeah. you explained what was going to happen before yeah. it happened. And you said, I wasn't going to be involved in this criminality. Well, no, exactly. We were literally sitting there in, in offices looking at, at tons of loans that were going to implode, derivatives that were going to implode, and, and being asked to sort of find a way to make money out of that for Goldman and for the companies, whether it was Enron or WorldCom, whatever those companies were. Um, and I found that incredibly untenable. Uh, it went through insurance companies, went through all sorts of So you weren't going to sell it to pensioners and people? I I, I had come to Goldman basically from a position where I believed, even in all the years I was in banking, that it was important to show people what the downside could be of certain types of speculation. And that was not something that Goldman really wanted to show. Um, and I had a lot of problems internally trying to be able to show analytics and develop things and get funding to, to show clients and, and, and investors in general what could go wrong. Because I thought, if you have knowledge, you can make a decision. If you don't, you're in a black hole and, and a fraudulent black hole. But then the opposite of you is some of the traders and people at Goldman and the Timberwolf stuff about this is total crud. Let's sell it to our customers. Well, that's what exactly happened was I left. And in the next few years that followed when I left, which was in early 2002, and I wrote a book in 2004, it came out in 2004, I wrote in 2003 about how all of this was going to implode and how these wars between the banks and these trading desks and were really being fought over people's loans. And that's what happened. The subprime loans, all of the regular loans in the country became fodder for these CDO deals like Timberwolf, like Abacus, like all the different names that were thrown at them that then imploded into the general economy a few years later. But at the time, the whole idea was to move, move, move the stuff off the trading books into the world. And that's what happened. And over the next few years from when I left until basically the beginning of 2007, that's what was happening. This stuff was proliferating the world, pension funds, small towns in Norway, small towns in, in, in Holland, you know, small towns in California, and really creating this crumbling decay of an economy. And I saw that from the outside. I wasn't inside at that point. And that's when I started writing more and more about that. And I continue to write about that because it's... It's a dangerous situation that people need to be aware of and need to have knowledge about. Not just the implosion that already happened that we think was over in 2008. It's not over. Well, that was my next question. I've seen the charts that there's more derivatives now than before. Right. They're taking the so-called bailout money, too big to fail, and re-leveraging it when they know it's impossible to ever pump it up. I believe, and I've seen a lot of evidence to show, it's conscious to get everything infected with it so they can then hold everybody hostage saying, do whatever we say in the future on any issue or everything will implode. And then they become rulers of the world. It's a Ponzi scheme that's too big to fail. And so the whole world falls to it instead of them all going to jail. I mean, do you agree with what Bernie Madoff said? I, I mean, I think I do, and other economists I've talked to have, that when he said, look, I'm just doing what everybody else did. And, and if so, why did he get in trouble then? 
He got in trouble because he didn't have as many political connections as some of these bigger guys who did not get in trouble. Yes, he created a Ponzi scheme. Yes, he lost a lot of people, a lot of money. Yes, he lied. Yes, he kept it going for years. And yes, the SEC was told about it by various whistleblowers throughout the years and decided for a decade, to yeah. ignore it completely until it was too big to ignore. But he was too little a guy, as big as he was, to save himself. That's unlike, right. Unlike, unlike John Corzine. And, and Jamie Diamond and, and Lloyd Blank and all these other guys who are basically at the top of either large implosions that have been obvious or smaller types of deceptions that have gone on for years. They are more politically connected um, to, the, to the administration, to the various, you know, the, the DOJ, the SEC, and all, all the organizations in Washington that refuse to really fight, jail, indict, convict any of the people that are really creating the larger global type of crimes against populations. Wow. Uh, again, you've gotten some praise for what you've done, but somebody like yourself or somebody like Amber Lyon, who had won all these Emmys at CNN uh, and uh, was you know, doing a great job, and then she found out the West just two years ago or a year ago was actually covering up and funding mass murders of men, women, and children at demonstrations in places uh, in the Middle East. And then she found out her show had been bought out basically $500,000 behind the scenes per episode just to shut her down. Not only was CNN killing the story, they were demanding payouts from the governments of Bahrain and others to cover it up. And she left, you know, a well-paying job. She's famous. She's, you know, uh, everywhere to stop that. You did the same thing, a managing director at Goldman Sachs over some key areas. Describe what you were over. Uh, and, and, of course... Uh, I would do the same thing. I have refused to sell out to big media and things just because there's no future if you don't. But why is that so rare nowadays? Or is it just we don't know about all the people that did the right thing? Um, I think there's a little bit of both. I think there's a lot of people who choose to leave those types of positions and just not become public. You know, just just go and do something else. I, I have friends who used to work at Goldman who are, you know, helping orphans in Nicaragua. You know what I mean? There, there's certain people that just don't get out there publicly and talk about it. and then there's some people that do and i think it's really hard people get complacent or or they need the money or whatever it might be or or they they consider what they're doing not so bad they're making a living they're making a big living they're making a ton of money whatever it might be and they don't tend to to take a look at themselves at the situation at the overall impact of it and and they, and they stay in these positions or they leave and it, it's really hard when i first came out with my book my first book other people's money um i was in london and there was a reporter that was asked at the london times magazine whether i had worked there um and this this question apparently i found out later went back to hank paulson in new york and i, I don't know what happened in between him and the london office but the london office denied i had even worked there for a second and then of course they couldn't and because the news came out and the reporter called me and said you worked here right i'm like yes i worked there I, yeah i've, I've paid, of course i did um, so, there, but there's a lot of, of difficulties along the way in, in trying to talk about you know, some very powerful institutions, you know, powerful individuals, and also a lot of esoteric financial stuff um, that's not always easy to explain to people. And it's a bunch so, of hocus pocus. Yes, it's it, it, it's it's taking stuff, financial loans, whatever they may be, and repackaging them to make them look better and throwing them on to, to someone else until the game is over. And the banks that created this stuff are fine or they're bailed out or they get to tax deduct losses and have all sorts of manners to to protect themselves. Whereas externally, there, there aren't those same kinds of protections. Um, and it's the same thing if you're inside of a system and you're trying to talk about it, whether you call it whistleblowing or explaining or creating knowledge or whatever you call it, it's, 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 it's very hard um, to go against that sometimes. And, and you have to be independent, I think, in order to do it a lot of the times. You have to decide, I'm not going to be part of that establishment. I'm not even going to necessarily... Sure. Uh, yeah, I don't believe it and I'm not going to be part of it. You know, they call it buffers or they call it uh, plausible deniability. But what I've seen the UN and Goldman Sachs and all these globalists are really good at is they have committees and they call things that are one thing, another thing, and then they all act like they have plausible deniability to not know, so no one ever gets left with a hand grenade. They're passing around the table, but then once they can't get in trouble, it creates this risk, this moral hazard they've talked about, where now they can get away with anything because it's all set up with a bunch of Sergeant Schultz saying, I know nothing, when they know full well what they're doing. 
and then you look at it, it's going to bring down the society, and they're gearing up the FEMA camps and the armed troops all over the world, and British Ministry of Defense reports admitting this is going to end civilization as we know it, because we'll never triage the debt, we'll never arrest these people. It's like you either cut them out, or we all are destroyed, and the answer is you'll be destroyed. It's, is there any way out of the madness? The thing is, these these people are the system, and 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 they've been the system. If you if you're running a major bank, if you're Jamie Dimon, um, or you're President Obama, you you are in You're linked. You have an alliance. You can't let the other person fail. So so if you're Obama and you're going into rise from you know state senate to senate to, to the president, you're Jamie Dimon. You're rising from the head of Bank One to the head of J P Morgan Chase to the you know the, the most important banker right now in 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 the country and and arguably the world. You are together, you keep each other up, and all these other systems that are in place, whether it's the Federal Reserve, the New York Federal Reserve, sure. the Department of Justice that ignores that anything can possibly Sure, that's how on. corruption works. That's how it happens, right. Because once they allow it in place, no one can bust anybody or it brings it down, and then suddenly corruption just takes over. Right, they, 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 they are the same people, and it's, it's mutually enforcing. It's enforcing within the banking industry on Wall Street, and it's enforcing between Washington and Wall Street. And, and what has happened since the, the crisis of 2008 is, is this ability to take down the economy, this, this massive amount of debt here in Europe, the instability in the Middle East, all of this is, is connected to the fact that there was a financial crisis that was predicated on bankers creating potential you know, fuzzy value out of nothing, proliferating the world with it, and then having the governments come in and hold their hands. Absolutely. Nomi Prince, yeah. NomiPrince.com. We've got to go to break. We come back. Tell us now where we're at currently and where you see us going, because you've been so accurate predicting things. Ted Anderson, president of Midas Resources. With over 30 years of experience in the precious metals business, I can tell you without a doubt, we are facing the most dangerous and volatile times, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Peace of mind is gold and silver. Now is the time to invest in gold. When it comes to bullion coins, our prices are competitive and the closest to melt. If it's numismatics you're looking for, we have some of the best deals out there. Visit MidasResources.com today or go to Infowars.com and click on the link to see our daily specials. Here's an example of one of our long-term specials we've been offering for more than a year. Two silver dollars from the turn of the last century, plus two powerful films, The Obama Deception and The American Dream. We also add in the book, Dishonest Money, all for $72 and free shipping. The most trusted name in precious metals is Midas Resources. Call 1-800-686-2237 or go to Infowars.com. I'm Ted Anderson with Midas Resources. We are now only entering the edge of a global financial superstorm, the likes of which the planet has never seen. Here in the United States, the private Federal Reserve is giving more than $85 billion of taxpayer money a month to themselves and other offshore foreign banks. And the worst part is, we have to pay the bank's interest on the money we give them. There is now a race between the global central bank mafia cartels to see who can devalue their country's currencies the fastest. We are already seeing big increases in inflation at the grocery store and the gas line. This will eventually lead to hyperinflation. More than a dozen top globalists like George Soros have been buying record amounts of gold while at the same time bad-mouthing it to the public. Don't just listen to what they say. Watch what they do. For more than 6,000 years of recorded human history, gold has been the ultimate hedge against uncertain times and inflation. Before investing in metals, it is important to do your own research and find a reputable company. Midas Resources has the highest Better Business Bureau rating of an A+. Unfortunately, very few precious metal companies can boast that. Midas Resources has assembled one of the most educated, researched, and professional teams of brokers in the industry. The evidence is overwhelming. In uncertain times, gold and silver is safe harbor. Now is the time to invest in gold. Call 800-686-2237 and Midas Resources will mail you 10 reasons to own gold absolutely free. No shipping. It's absolutely free. And finally, Ted Anderson wants to challenge you to find any deal that comes close to his two silver dollars at cost with free shipping with two free films and a book for $72. That's more than $160 value for $72 shipping included. Click the link at Infowars.com to go to the MidasResources.com specials page. Brought to you by MidasResources.com and Ted Anderson the trusted name in precious metals.
Her current best-selling book is It Takes a Pillage. Behind the bonuses, bailouts, and backroom deals from Washington to Wall Street, it's Naomi Prince. She was a managing uh, director. I remember reading your first book about this in 2006. Y you were actually able to see all of it because in, in your position, weren't you like over the big international transfers and, and, and trying to make sure that uh, the regulations meshed on these deals? Yeah, that's a very good memory. I, I had been responsible for a particular group that focused on financial clients, insurance companies, banks, um, pension funds, and any basically financial investor, and try to look at how, um, if they were going to be seeing any losses, um, how those could be sort of repackaged and sold off of their books. So if a bank was going through a potential loss or insurance company had some claims that weren't working, package them up, reconstruct them into something else, and, and sell them along to other investors. So there was a lot of that. And I was also responsible for the analytics um, in derivatives and credit derivatives, which became at the, the center of all this stuff, um, and the nascent um, development of CDOs, which, you know, you talk about. So you were right in the middle of it. I was in the middle of it before it became some prime. It was, it was corporate debt. And you was, just watched Enron go to jail. That's the good part of, about people getting in trouble. It makes other people think. You said, I'm getting out of here. Well, I left before they even go to jail. I, 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 I knew when they were imploding. I knew when their positions were, were imploding because um, Goldman was actually a trading partner in, in derivatives with Enron. So it was, it was pretty easy to know what was what was going to go on. Um, and that was around the fall, of course, of 9-11. And I wound up leaving for a number of reasons. 9-11 was a very personal um, you know, issue for, for, for anyone who was working down on Wall Street at the time. And then I was also an element of life's too short. Oh, wow. You were in New York when that happened? Yeah, I mean, I was down on Goldman when, at Goldman when that happened, which is oh, wow. a few blocks away from the World Trade Center. Wow. You know, so we're there with the, you know, the darkened windows, all, so not really knowing what's going on at that point. We're just inside a building before all the information started coming out. So, um, so as that came out, that, that, was, that was a big sort of call to you know, examine all the things that I'd already been bothered about. A major reality check. Major, major. Um, and, and I quit you know, a few months after that. So there was a, and that was a whole, all of that was going on at the same time. And there was the World Trade Center, there was 9-11, there was... Enron's fraud, there was, you know, the, the upcoming telecom frauds that were all come out after I left. Um, and a lot of that stuff going on. And also, I mean, the atmosphere was, was toxic. It, all, it, it always was. Um, but it, it just became way too much. When we hear these recordings of Goldman Sachs guys bragging about, yeah, I'm going to cheat these old ladies. Oh, that earthquake, that was my wallet dropping. Yeah, we're going to sell these, you know, idiots, this crud. <laughs> I mean, how many of them are like that? Um, th there are some loudmouths who are who are definitely definitely like that, and then there's ones that are that are more reserved. You know, there's the old school bankers, and and there's the ones who have actually done quite well being you know being like that. Um, going back to 9/11, when I when I when we were there on the on the trading floor, and there was all the smoke and stuff around, the the oil guys were st were on the desk, and their boss was saying like, hey, you know, make money. Like w we don't know what's going on, no one knows what's going on, but you know what? It had to do with a plane, planes, oil, oil, money. You know, keep trading. Um, you know, and that's the kind of environment that, that uh, a lot of those types of, of guys are very, very... And then they're like, hey, just tell the firefighters that the dust isn't bad so we can stay open. And don't tell them to wear respirators because then they'll know it's bad. Then we'll have to close everything. Tell them it's safe when they had a report hours after saying it's deadly. They had sensors. Again, it just shows these are these people are out of their minds. They wanted us to all come down to work, you know, the next day, two days later, when the city was mostly closed. I didn't come down. I mean, again, this was all sort of you know part of, of my own combinations of revelations over the years. But yeah, there was there was people down in down in those offices. Um, very. Let me ask you this question. This is a short segment, long segment coming up, and then I want to get into whatever you think's most important to talk about. I mean, so tell me if these questions uh, uh, aren't good or aren't as important as they should be. Uh, where to go? Where does it all end? I mean, I look at the derivatives. Some numbers are 600 trillion. Some are lower. Some are higher. Uh, what is going to happen with all of this? Where does it end? Because they're only expanding all of it, from what I've seen. Where does it end? Right. The, the expansion happens from the fact that since the crisis, these banks that were big have gotten bigger. You know, they've been allowed to merge. They've had federal backing. They continue to have federal backing. They know they can continue um, with creating you know, bigger derivatives positions, taking more fees off their regular clients to be able to grow what they're doing in the speculative world and so forth. But what they know right now is that they will be supported. Um, so again, it's this mutual support system from the Federal Reserve and the ECB to keep the U.S. banks and the, and the European banks, which basically control the entire global financial system, um, up as long as they can. So you create debt, you keep rates at down low, you keep it going, you keep it going. Meanwhile, the derivatives positions, um, the, the more risky types of transactions in which these banks are operating, also continue to blow up because they're being supported. 
They've been bailed out. They're being supported to go on and go forward. I, I don't really think that ends. I think what's happening now is when there's this false period of you know, an anesthetic of, of these um, of these types of bailout programs and these zero interest rates, which are just going to kind of keep things in an indefinite limbo until the next shoe drops, which I believe will happen because this cannot continue forever. And I want to talk about how big that next shoe will be, what's happening in the bond market, and so much more with Nomi Prince. Straight ahead, she was a managing director at Goldman Sachs and left rather than be involved in all the corruption. Because there's a war on for your mind. That has been our motto here at InfoWars for my 18 years of battle against the globalist. And now we see the open announcements of global, private, corporate tyranny over our governments. That's what the New World Order is. It's an unaccountable private combine of organized crime engaged in corporate takeovers of nation states. And the conscious attempt to abolish basic rights and fundamental liberties. Infowars.com is not just leading the charge against this here in the U.S. or North America. We are leading the charge worldwide. And that's because our listeners, our viewers, our supporters, fellow freedom lovers like you across the planet resonate with our message of liberty and telling it like it is. And that's why for the last two years especially, I have thrown everything I've got, my time, my energy, our backup capital, everything into really trying to awaken the sleeping giant that is humanity. And that's why the July issue that just came in a few days ago is so important. We've already sold about half the stock we have of it at cost in groups of 10 up to 100 in bulk. It covers the entire NSA spy grid, how it ties in worldwide, how it's not about stopping terrorists, but about suppressing and dominating and controlling the free press and political opposition. And in this magazine, we don't just have three free bumper stickers like I did a few months ago. We have 10 bumper stickers, four full-size ones with amazing messages guaranteed to get people thinking like America has been occupied by globalist forces, InfoWars.com. Listen to Alex Jones at InfoWars.com. InfoWars.com, forbidden information. Listen to Alex Jones, InfoWars.com. And then on top of it, six medium-sized bumper stickers with the message as well. These are key to post in legal and lawful areas on your book bag, your computer, your car, or to give friends and family. I have printed 500,000 of these bumper stickers. Only half of this month's run of magazines has them. So when you purchase them in bulk or you're a 12-month subscriber, you will get the special issue. And I can't afford to do this every month, so it's going to be quite a while until we do this again. Please take advantage of this. Buy them in bulk and give them to your friends and family and encourage them to get these bumper stickers out because with 500,000 stickers, we can reach tens of millions of people with the message of truth. They want to collectivize us. They want to bankrupt us. They want to drive us into their arms to control us. They want to dumb us down. But the sleeping giant that is for humanity is awakening. So I want to thank you all for your support. I want to encourage everybody to go to InfoWarsStore.com and to get a 12-month subscription or to give a gift subscription. Imagine 12 of these coming to your friends or family's door to wake them up. Or to give a gift subscription to the local police department or your local congressman or woman. This is how we're going to affect change, voting with our dollars and voting with our time. Again, visit InfoWarsStore.com today to subscribe, to get the magazine in bulk, or to give a gift subscription, or to give yourself a subscription to wake up friends and family. I am all in. I am committed 110% to not mince words and to not back off and to boldly confront the globalist. And our listeners and supporters, our info warriors, who aren't behind us, they're right beside us. So I want to thank all of you that have supported us in the past, and I want to encourage all of you out there who may be on the fence that know this information is true but have been scared to take action. You had better be scared of not taking action and letting this monstrous system come to fruition. Now is the time to commit. Now is the time to say which side of history you're on. Now is the time to stand against the globalist and the new world order. And regardless of whether you get this July issue, this July 4th resistance to tyrants issue, spread the word about liberty, resist corruption in your area. Millions of us doing little things can move mountains together. 
I'm Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars.com and the InfoWars team. Is her latest book. She's got another book coming out soon. We're going to talk about that. And I know we got callers that have been holding before she got on all over the map. We'll take your calls, a little bit of overdrive, while she gets some lunch. And I'm going to interview her for Obama Deception, too. So I'll be going into the third hour uh, some of the days. I seem to do all the time. You know, I quit doing four hours every day a few years ago because I needed to get ready for the nightly news and build the media operation. But then why not just go back to four hours? It's like I quit doing the four hours. Some stations quit carrying it. And now I'm back to doing four hours. But <laughs> There's just so much to cover. Uh, but first, some of our sponsors that make this broadcast possible. PrivateInternetAccess.com. We hear news stories every day about NSA spying on U.S. citizens, keeping your information private on the web has never been more important. PrivateInternetAccess.com specializes in keeping your information private by encrypting your internet connection, hiding your IP address so that you can browse the internet anonymously, offering firewall protection to prevent data mining, eliminating records, uh, of your computer activity. PrivateInternetAccess.com is an American company, and you can use this service anywhere on the internet connection in the world. Again, you can uh, check it out uh, right now uh, at PrivateInternetAccess.com. They have a lot of other services. Great folks. PrivateInternetAccess.com. Also, uh, InfidelBodyArmor.com. Unlike uh, ceramic armor that only stops six rounds, this stops hundreds. Stops hundreds of rounds from AK-47, M4, 30 odd six, 308 and more. Fits uh, sizes medium to XXL. They got a bunch of other products as well. Backpacks, you name it. Amazing stuff. Made in America. Related to, uh, rated to level four body armor. 888-608-6605. The longest lasting body armor is now cheaper than most ammo for the first time by the pound. Infidelbodyarmor.com. Infidelbodyarmor.com. And lastly, efoodsdirect.com forward slash Alex. This special ends tomorrow. They've never done a special like this. You buy three of any of their huge selections of storable foods. You get the fourth free plus free shipping. They rarely do free shipping, so that's a double whammy of goodness. And we do this because all of us should be prepared. All of us should hope for the best, prepare for the worst, have a strong offense against the globalist while preparing a defense in fallback positions. This is serious. The government's stockpiling food as well. The place to get it is eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex or 800-409-5633, 800-409-5633. And don't forget all our other great products and videos and films and everything, Store. Com. That's how we're building the people's media system in resistance to the globalists. Now, Nomi Prinz, again, former managing director at Goldman Sachs, nomiprinz.com, best-selling author, whistleblower from the early 2000s, prolifically uh, predicting, because I read the book in 2006 and said, I got to get this lady on, uh, the first book she put out on the subject, and, and because she said everything that was going to happen, and as she said, she wrote the book three years before. I read it two years after it was after, uh, out. And, and, and now she's got several other uh, books uh, that are uh, out as well. But, but expanding, you were saying during the break, things about Obama I want to get to in a moment. But first off, uh, Naomi, get into my big question. How do you expect things to unravel? How do, how do the experts you respect that have a good track record of predicting things, how do they say the next shoe will drop and what it will look like? And what's happening in these rigged markets? How long will it go as we learn about LIBOR and uh, the fixing of interest rates and, and, and the fact that high-frequency trading? I mean, this thing is a giant rigged casino ripping people off. How will it melt down? Will it melt down? And if it doesn't melt down, what will it do at the expense of the people? Okay, first of all, this historic period right now, we have had a longer series of cheap money, of 0% of, of interest rates, of the Federal Reserve, the ECB, bolstering all of the financial toxic assets that were built, the financial system that was being uh, proliferated into the into the world and, and, and how that was going to self-destruct. It continues to hold it up. The stock market is held up by this. Any corporate profits um, of the companies that are larger and that are still posting corporate profits, although they're not really hiring, they are posting profits, are doing so because it is so cheap for them, not individuals, but for banks and for their 
main customers to raise money. This is why it looks, there's the appearance between the stock market and some of the corporate bond market that things are healthy. There's the appearance that banks are doing okay. They haven't had to because of accounting laws that have been changed in 2008 when the financial crisis happened that have allowed them to really camouflage losses that they continue to carry on their books. Meanwhile, they've expanded derivatives and all sorts of other esoteric things they're doing because it doesn't cost them anything to do that. That's the market we're in right now. We've Synthetic never, derivatives? Synthetic derivatives, basically meaning creating packages of packages of packages of, of things that have no value. And the reason these packages of things that have no value, which we're supposed to you know, take a loan, a regular, simple, basic loan. You know, you pay me an interest rate. I take a piece of it. I pay my expenses. I make some profit. You do that a ton, a ton of times, and the loan has no value because the asset underneath it has gone to zero, and you create a derivative and another derivative, and you repackage and repackage. Yeah, you're basically running on fumes. So this and then it's hidden me. under red tape. It's hidden under accounting laws that, that are effectively designed to camouflage these losses so that they give the appearance that these banks are in a So where does state. it go? When does it end? It, 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 the, the, the Federal Reserve has been very tactical in keeping these rates at the zero levels that they are. And every single time Bernanke comes out and says the economy might be getting a little better and, and there might be a possibility that, that QE, quantitative easing, or the Fed buying the debt that is manufactured by, by banks and by the Treasury Department to keep this all going and keep rates low. Every time that happens, the market wobbles, everybody freaks out. And Bernanke comes back and says something like, oh, you know what, it actually kind of is bad. We're going to keep going with this. And then everything's all, all fine again visually in the market and, and, and in the bond market, the reality is it's not real. Um, these are all artificially being lifted. How long does that last? It's lasted at this point for four and a half years. It can continue to last for another year and a half too because he can't really take his foot off quantitative easing. And whoever comes in after Bernanke is going to have a really tough time doing the same thing. I believe this policy is going to continue. Meanwhile, the European economies are, are imploding. The real U.S. economy isn't doing very well if you take away the, the, the bigger banks and institutions benefiting from cheap money, from zero interest rate money. Um, so I think this continues this time, another few years with slow implosion at, at, at the center, at the core economies um, in Europe, in the Middle East, in the U.S. Which is what they've America. said. They want slow, slow implosion. It's a slow bleed. That, that's yeah. exactly what's going on now, which is different from before. Before, rates were sort of normal. They came low. Banks were doing all sorts of creativity with, with, with subprime loans and creating all these toxic assets and getting into the derivatives market and everything else. Now, it's all been subsidized. So now this can continue for another, it's not as quick to the next few um, comes down. I, I think it could take more like three or four years of but a very slow, painful time until that happens, until derivatives are, are so expansive, until there cannot be more money pumped in, until the debt is so high that it can't be kept at zero because nobody wants to buy it, no country, no funds, and there's just no cash left to set aside to do this. And that's when I think you get the next implosion. But I don't think that's for another few years. I think it's a slow drip until then. And is it going to be a lot bigger when it implodes next? There's a lot more riding on it. There's a lot more riding on it. There's a bigger derivatives market. These banks have grown bigger, the ones that have survived. What about the bond market? We're seeing more talk of the Chinese currency being more the world reserve currency. Other countries and groups are moving away from the dollar, and, and, and now they're starting to cut back on the treasuries. But then they use the dollar imploding. People get scared and come and prop it up. It kind of seesaws back and forth. Uh, what does What's happening in the bond market uh, in layman's terms? What does that signify? Uh, this limbo period that that that, that I'm talking about, that you you just mentioned now. In effect, it's 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 a limbo market. The bonds stay, prices sort of stay where they are. They might dip a little, and then the Fed comes in and says, "No, we're going to continue to buy bonds," which means we're going to continue to keep rates low, which means we're going to continue to keep the cost of money at zero for the big institutions. We keep doing that. That's why the dollar, which should be a lot lower, it, it should represent a lot less value um, in 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 the external in, in in the markets than it does, because it's being everything is being propped up. If the purchasers of Treasury bonds stop buying or start selling. The Chinese start selling. The Japanese start selling. It hurts them too, and uh, you know, as you just said. So, so everybody. So is we're sitting on game. top of powder we're keg. Sitting on the same game. Everyone's in the same game right now, and that's but, why the But they're are they're depressing the real economy while expanding their own economy. That's why all the luxury goods go up. Yes. Other stuff only grows slowly uh, in inflation. But I've I've just seen where real interest rates for the general public are going up. And then now they have this supposed, you know, zero percent 
but that's only for the insiders. That's becoming more and more obvious. How long can that go on? Because I'm seeing the attitude in the general public become hyper aware. I mean, you've got some that'll buy anything, but I'm seeing on talk radio, listening to other shows, uh, and I'm seeing on the streets, and I'm seeing in Gallup poll, lowest approval rating ever for the media and for Congress and for Obama. I'm, I don't think people are buying into the bull anymore. And so how long can this go? Again, I, I think it, it individuals, the real economy, do understand and, and do see costs going up, health care costs, education costs, food costs, you know, the, the, the cost of living versus what Plus it Plus the education doesn't do anything anymore. You can't get out and get a job. Or, or you can get a couple jobs that don't really pay you, don't get benefits, whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, globalism's killing us. It doesn't work. The quality of the real economy is, is deteriorating while the artificiality of this, this banking economy continues to be subsidized by cheap money, which the rest of the public can't get to because um, banks are sitting on it and because they have the benefit, they don't pass it on. Um, I, again, I, I think that continues for another few years. It continues until someone says, you know what, the Fed has to dial back. Um, because the United States and the banking system of the United States and the Federal Reserve that, that you know, basically is the bankers bank in the United States continues to create a policy that makes them all look good while it doesn't do anything for the real economy. So we're continuing to fragment. So it's good that people are looking at their own lives and trying to sort of detach themselves as much as they can. But at the same time, it's going to deteriorate the quality. Well, let me ask you this. And obviously, it's not just making them look good. They're, they're hoarding the bailout money. They're becoming just so fabulously rich. It's a joke. How will they spend the money if they wreck the entire society? Right, no, it, yeah, as you say, luxury goods on, on saving it away, on why does Jamie Dimon get to make $10 million a year? I mean, all of these things continue to allow them to, to hoard institutionally and to hoard for themselves personally, and, and, and that's definitely what they're doing. Well, let me expand on this. They're building government bunkers, they're hoarding food. Uh, Goldman Sachs people are buying guns, that's come out in Bloomberg. Uh, they're digging in. They're buying retreats. Why are they doing that? Why they do they have the money now? They have the money now, and they know at some point um, there might be an inavailability to get some of these things because there there won't be enough people creating them. It'll it, you know, uh, individual economies will be so bad. There's going to be a deterioration on that side. So what they're doing is they're taking their money and running. It's it's a definition of not being left with the bag. If they have the money now, if they have cheap rates now, if they're getting great bonuses now, if the stock market's up high now, they're they're in there first. And so when the stock market does come down dramatically and we saw it can happen from two no no but that's my point they're digging in like it's the end of the world and they're going to have a civil war with us i mean i have the fbi training manuals and the i mean they're training to mass arrest people and stuff and and take over cities and i mean they're acting like they're going to bring us into a total depression and the more money they have at the top of that pile the the, the more protected they are from what's happening to the rest of but how about they all just get arrested like Bernie Madoff? Because I've talked to Ron Paul, a lot of people I respect, they say there's ways to fix this for the general public that are fair and constitutional. Why do we let these crooks run everything? Well, that's not, but, but, I, mean, I mean, it's the question of like, why do women like bad guys? Uh, you know, that old joke. I just do not get why we let these crooks run everything. Those crooks are are the government right now, and that, that that's the problem. We're talking. You know, Bernie Madoff was not part of the, the the fraternity. Oh, the Justice Department, the law firm that the Attorney General's part of, is the one that does the certifications on all this fraud. Right, and all these people who create all these fraud are the ones who supported the current administration let's say, in in doing what they do. They they are all mutually enforcing each other. That's why they don't arrest each other. You know, you point a finger at one, somebody goes down, everybody else goes down. Diamond goes down, everyone goes down. Right, he's connected to everybody. And how is the cult of Obama? Uh, allowed them, uh, could have Bush, if he had a third term, have gotten away with this? And, and has Obama been better or worse than Bush on letting banks run uh, wild? Bush came to office with a lot of initial banker support. When he was just um, a senator, uh, when he won the, the, the Obama. state senator, Obama. Yeah, and then I'll go back to Bush. But when basically he came in, he really had, he already had Goldman Sachs behind him as one of his top 20 donors. This is not into the president. This is into the, into the Senate seat. Uh, you know, he had... Uh, J.P. Morgan, as J. Morgan Chase is one of his donors, et cetera. He was in Chicago before that, where Bank One, which has now become a part of J.P. Morgan Chase, and that's what Jamie Dimon used to run, was there at the same time, you know, in, in the same Chicago Tower near wherever it is, you know, the Senate is, when he was a local state senator and so forth. I mean, they basically have had a relationship going back before he even set foot. He's been fast-tracked from Washington, the beginning. From the beginning. Um, Bush uh, did, of course sign the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act in 2008. Obama lobbied for it. 
Obama lobbied for it, but Bush did sign it, and Bush did say, and, I, and this is in his memoirs, you know, we're going all in. Now, when he said we're going all in, it was before, you know, it was before 2009 when there really was an all-in situation when, when the Fed came in and created all these additional programs uh, to, to pile on to the, the TARP program, which was only $700 billion, and added all these other ways for banks to be subsidized um, in the tune of trillions of dollars that happened during Obama's administration. So, so there was a point at which Bush was interested in in doing this and truly, uh, you know, and, and, and Hank Paulson sort of straddled both presidents for a second. I mean, he was, you know, he wasn't Treasury Secretary under Obama, of course, Tim sure. was, but they worked together under Bush beforehand. So to some extent, there was a transition into it. But Obama came in with a lot of backing from the banking system. Um, and he, he came in with, with no regard to creating smaller banks from these bigger banks. I mean, he, he could have had a policy where he could have directed Congress. Yeah, I mean, I mean you told me on air he was, smaller. Yeah, uh, he told me off air he was worse than Bush, basically. He, he was worse in terms of allowing these banks to become bigger and more powerful and have more federal subsidies. And in the process... Um, sure, from what I've seen, they've been waging war on real local banks, and now they're yeah. trying to take over credit unions. Because they can, again, they have, not only this, this cheap money we're talking about, they, they have access to more of it more easily. They're larger member banks of the Federal Reserve System. They get to be able to have the position of, of being the big guy and, and beating up the little guy. And this has been happening you know, in U.S. history for the last 100 years, but it's been happening in particular in the last several years because they have been validated. You know, we don't have a war. We don't have, you know, there, we just have zero interest rates and a, and, a, and a policy between Washington and Wall Street that enables these largest institutions to get increased increasingly bigger on cheaper money. It's a total banking to take takeover. To take over it's a total takeover. I mean, I read the local banking association stuff in, in the Austin uh, Business Journal and stuff, and uh, the head of the Texas Banking Association sounds like Ron Paul or myself or you. I mean, what we're saying is not radical uh, vision of it's this. Rational. This is this is what's going on. Yeah, it, We've got foreign mega offshore above the law banks who engineered all this, using it to take over. I had an article yesterday where they're in Congress right now trying to take away tax exemption from credit unions. I, I mean, it's incredible. It, it, it's a way to hurt the smaller ones and the ones that are lobbying for that. Of course, the bigger institutions who, who want control. Who of wrote the, the tax laws and don't even pay taxes anyway. And, and have a lot more lobbyists working for them. That's, I mean, if we let them shut down the credit unions, I mean, is there no end to this? That's why we have to basically say, you know what, we're going to continue to support credit unions or, lo or local banks um, because they're not going to say, okay, we're going to back out. <laughs> you know, Chase, Citigroup, Bank of America, they're not going to stay out. You have to basically give your business to the smaller institutions. A absolutely. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Now you can watch the InfoWars nightly news streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at InfoWars.com forward slash show. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a joke. Florida, where they banned most pipes, uh, they're felonies with the crazy governor. It looks like a space alien. Makes me believe what David Icke says. They've now banned all computers. Florida outlaws all computers. Legislation was signed into law by Florida's former Tea Party favorite, Rick Scott, that bans all computers because they didn't properly uh, read the bill. Uh, totally bizarre. Got that article. A bunch of other important news. TSA harasses and shames yet another disabled veteran. That's up on Infowars.com. Canadian cop gives homeless woman lunch money. That story won't go viral, but we should show people good behavior uh, to try to model off that. Sustainable Development Park violates artists' First Amendment rights. TSA uh, sniffing bags at Texas Shopping Mall. Heart-eating cannibal demands Obama send more weapons. You cannot make this stuff up. Uh, police firefighters ordered not to speak about Michael Hastings' crash. We're in a little bit of overdrive with you, Nomi, so you can get into your new book that's coming out next year and the research, but... I uh, also want to get your take uh, on, on the Michael Hastings. Um, now it's coming out that the police won't release the police report, and they've told police and firefighters don't talk about what they saw. But the witnesses saw it blow up driving down the street, and he said he was going into hiding. He'd had death threats and was about to break a big story. Gee, sounds like there should be an investigation to me. Yeah, you know, I, um, I had seen Michael Hastings a few uh, weeks before. Um, that event at a, at a book party actually for uh, for Dirty Wars. Um, friend of his, Jeremy Scahill. You know, great film, great movie, um, great book. And um, I walked over to the site um, the day after, 
um, when I, when I heard about it. It's, it's actually close to, it's not too far away from where, where I live. It's, it's in walking distance. Um, just to check out the sort of tree situation, you know, in terms of how, um, you know, it, it's an area, and I know there's been clips, and you've seen clips, um, shown clips on your show where yeah, it's two straightaway, you know, easy types of, you know, there's a road that goes straight. Highland is, you know, it's, it's a very easy double lane uh, road, you know, Melrose cutting and it's, it's very visual. It's very, you know, even if you're going pretty fast at, at four in the morning, for whatever reason you might be doing it, it's, 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 it's hard to imagine, you know, missing that on your own, um, you know, and, and hitting a tree on, on, on your own. Um, I, you know, I don't know what he was doing there in the middle of the night, of course. But. Sure, sure. But the witnesses say it blew up in the middle of the street and then went over by the tree. And then now they're saying, "Don't release the police report." I mean, this is this is amazing. The fact that they're not releasing the, the the police report, the fact that you know the FBI basically said we 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 weren't even you know looking at him for any reason at all. I mean, this guy was doing intense things. Well, it turns out that the family and friends say no, they did. They were visited, and they're all scared because they see the FBI. I've talked to them. They see the FBI on the news saying we didn't visit them, and they did, and they're like. <gasps> I mean, people, they know now. They're all scared. Just the fact that the FBI denied everything because, you know, usually it would be like, well, we can't comment. You know, there, there, was, a, there was a strong denial that they were looking into him or, or doing anything instead of a just we can't comment, which in itself is, is a little odd. Um, but, but just the physicality of, of the location, um, you know, just, just seemed like it, it more lends itself to, to, to being something that happened in advance of, of him taking over the car, or him driving the car. Or sure, sure. What, are the, him driving the what car. did the tree look like? Uh, the tree is pretty solid. I mean, it was, it's a fat tree. So if, if anything was hitting it for whatever reason, whether it was pre-explosion or post-explosion, uh, you know, the tree wasn't going to be going anywhere. But, but at the same time, if you were just driving regularly, even if you were under the influence, which we don't even know, I'm not, I'm not saying he was, I'm just saying yeah. any, any person, if they were, um, yeah, there, there, there's, there's a ton of space to continue to going straight. Sure, I've, I've hit an oak tree way. backwards at about 60, because yeah. a tornado blew me and my dad off the road, and I mean, it still hammered in about eight inches into the tree. I mean, it gouged a big thing yeah. out of, it was, it was actually two oak trees, yeah. uh, one, one big one, one medium size. I mean, how, how tore up did the tree look? The tree didn't look particularly torn up. Because when I've seen from the photos, it looked like it came resting up against the tree. Blew up in the street, no skid marks, up against the tree. Right. Uh, maybe a millimeter gouge into it, but a large area. Right. We're going to come right back. I want to talk about uh, how they got Glass-Steagall in the 30s and how we could get it back in place again. Stay with us. Our viewers have demanded it, so now you're going to get it. More pro Second Amendment gun shows in the month of June. What we've learned is you cannot hide behind an I beam when there's a 50 cal present. Brothers in Arms, 50 cal ammo review, and more coming in the month of June to the Info War. You were telling me during the break before last about your research into how the bankers have been broken up before. Uh, tell the, the audience about that, Nomi Prince. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of research for this this, this book, um, the new one, All the President's Bankers. And I go back to Teddy Roosevelt, but, but through now and all the alliances between bankers and presidents and kind of what went on behind the scenes and how they sort of interact. And in particular, Glass-Steagall, right, we've just come out of currently a financial crisis where banks have been made bigger rather than smaller, where they have been consolidated rather than split up, um, and where we are therefore less stable as a global economy because of that. Back in the 30s, of course, there was a Great Depression following the crash in 1929 and a lot of shady deals that went into that crash. But the difference between then and now, between you know, FDR and Obama, who says he models himself after FDR, um, FDR also had a lot of friends who were bankers. You know, he, he grew up with them. He hung out. They yachted. They, 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 they knew each other for, for, for decades. But what he did was he understood that the banking system had to be stabilized. And bankers at the time, the two top bankers at the time, the head of what has now become Citigroup, Jim, per um, uh, uh, um, Jim Perkins, who was head of National Citibank, and Winthrop Aldrich, who was in the Rockefeller family, but, but head of Chase at the time, went to FDR. They had a meeting two days after FDR took office, and they agreed, the three of them, Winthrop wasn't there, um, National Citibank guy was, that he was going to split up his bank. Before the legislation passed, 
They said we will split up the investment and trading, the speculation side, from the commercial banking, the side that deals with real people and real deposits and you know real loans. Because we are facing a large problem and it will only get bigger if we do not do this, if we don't take the risk out of the banking system. So yeah, they were self-interested. But what FDR did was say, okay, I'm gonna push that. The bankers were gonna push that. The population was fine with that. You know, They got deposit insurance out of it. Everybody was happy and the system was stable for decades. You look at now and we had a situation where the financial crisis was arguably bigger because it was more diffuse than what happened. Sure, and they're doing more of the same instead of even reversing in any way. And looking at this, for those that don't understand what we're talking about, they have fractional reserve banking in the regular banking system that already gives them unfair trade advantage. That's why they run everything. But they can always have these derivatives type fraudulent, you know, other type of speculative banking. You certainly want that to be on its own for people that want to go down to the racetrack and be involved yeah. in that. No, what they've done is they've, they've, they've involved everybody and the whole currency and the whole country and the whole world in their big fraud. And we're saying that needs to be at least separated off and they won't even do that. Right, so, so the same bankers that, that, that had the opportunity, you know, different legacy bankers, but had the opportunity to do this and save the system and, 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 and corner off the risky stuff did it then and now they're not even considering doing now now they want to go away from that now they you know they they're, they're lobbying against anything like that but also the president did nothing about that he didn't he didn't say that the banks should be split out he didn't say the rational thing to do rather than than mingle you know some normal everyday person's money with these giants who can speculate it away and then get subsidized where the normal person doesn't um, no one's trying to do any of that. Or very few people are trying to do anything that in Washington. It's not going to happen right now with the people that we have running the White House and running the banking system. It, it just won't happen like it did back then. And therefore, we're still in a less stable environment than we were uh, in coming out of the Great Depression. In closing, look at carbon taxes. And there's a lot of real environmental issues with the carbon taxes. Goldman Sachs came up with it with Enron on record back in the mid-90s, Al Gore. And now they're saying that'll fund things, $100 trillion every decade to us, direct taxes. Let's do one more segment, come back and talk about what happened in Cyprus. You game to do that? Sure. Fantastic. Because I want to talk about what we've seen in Europe to understand what's coming for us down the road. We'll take a few calls for Naomi Prince here with us, uh, Georgia, Connecticut, and others. And then I've got other callers all over the map. I'll get to you. I promise to do it. So we'll come back, answer that question, do one more segment with her in overdrive that she's going to uh, be interviewed for Obama deception. You won't see that until uh, November. Nomi Prince, nomiprince.com is here. I'm Alex Jones with Infowars.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Johnny Appleseed was born during the Revolutionary War. He's not just a legend. And in more than five states, he introduced apples that had not even been grown in the colonies. Later, the seeds from plants he planted and cultivated and some of the varieties he developed spread across the United States. And it was Johnny Appleseed teaching the colonists and then the new Americans after we won independence the love of planting fruit trees that introduced that idea to North America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a revolutionary act to unplug from the television, to unplug from the computer and all the globalist propaganda and to go out in your backyard or your front yard or planters at your apartment or on the roof of the building where you live and to plant a garden. Become the Johnny Appleseed of your community with seeds from the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsStore.com. The simple act of planting fruits and vegetables and then tending them and taking care of them and then sharing them with friends and family is a revolutionary act against tyranny. The globalists, first and foremost, do not want us to be self-sufficient. The crony anti-free market capitalist, the fascist, are using socialism and collectivism to shut down societies. Stalin in Poland and in Ukraine and other areas, starved on record more than 10 million people over five years by not letting them grow their own crops and collectivizing them. Mao killed between 65 million and 80 plus million people doing this same thing. The UN says they will use food as a weapon. They use genetic evil to attack the earth and major GMO companies have been caught 
going into growth belts around the world, even where GMO is illegal, and planting seeds everywhere to infect the genetics of the original crops. Almost all of the thousands of varieties of Mexican corn has been infected. They are in a genetic war against everyone. That's why we have to get these seeds and not just plant them on our own gardens and not just give them as gifts to friends and family to plant spring and summer and fall gardens. I'm calling on you to go out into the green belts, to go out into the areas and plant secret gardens. No, not of marijuana, but of the hundreds and hundreds of incredible high quality uh, vegetables and herbs and fruit plants that are here. Lemons and oranges, the list goes on and on. They will grow, uh, plum trees, grape trees, they will grow almost everywhere in the U.S. We can literally, not just buying these products from InfoWarsStore.com, but from wherever you get them. This aggressive program literally just came to me one morning when I woke up about 4 a.m. realizing that we've got to counter their genetic war against us with original real crops developed over eons on this planet. We have the lowest prices we bought it in the biggest bulk that some of these companies have ever seen to ship this directly to you from the InfoWars Command Center. We stand for life. We stand for liberty. We stand for self-sufficiency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com, click on the Seed Center, and as of taping this, we have the seven top respected brands. We intend to continue to do research and find other companies, other specialties, other varieties to really take action. The InfoWars Store Seed Center has the largest online selection of heirloom, non-GMO seeds. Check out these products from our newest supplier, Heirloom Organics. The Medicine Garden for a natural remedy. The Tea Garden that contains every important tea herb you can grow. Fruit Lovers with 12 varieties. And the Tobacco Pack, additive and pesticide free. Join the gardening revolution today at InfoWarsStore.com. This is a revolutionary action we're asking you to take. Plant seeds everywhere today. Nurture them, bring them to fruit, and pass on the knowledge to others. Become human again. Discover your roots in the soil. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. <laughs> All right, folks, Alex Jones here back live in overdrive. Some stations carry it. If your local affiliate doesn't, you can just go to InfoWars.com forward slash show to find all the free iPhone, Droid app, the podcast, uh, the free video feed, all of it right there at InfoWars.com forward slash show. And please send that link on to your friends and family as well because that's how we reach more people. So many times folks say, I saw an InfoWars.com bumper sticker or uh, my neighbor told me to turn to this local AM or FM affiliate or... Somebody sent me the link to your podcast, or somebody sent me a link to the iTunes, or somebody sent me a link to their membership at PrisonPlanet.tv, and I logged on and used it. It's incredible. It woke me up. Every subject, every expert you can imagine, I forgot to plug uh, in, the, uh, in the last hour that we have a very special guest joining us uh, tomorrow. For two hours, is it? This is going to be legendary? Well, he told me... Oh, at least an hour, but it is nailed down for tomorrow. 100% nailed down. 100% nailed down. The fish is on the line, but not in the boat. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I need to stop right there. Uh, I act like Ted Knight from Caddyshack sometimes. Uh, Nomi Prins continuing here, uh, getting into more serious issues. Cyprus and what we saw there. And now they're going, yeah, maybe we need bail-ins here. Uh, you know, direct tax for the bankers. Uh, and then Congress, uh, QE3, 80-something billion a month, was 40 billion, then 85 billion, disappearing into a black hole. Congress says, where does it go? Uh, the Treasury says, just shut up, you know, and smacks him across the cheek. Uh, what is going on with Cyprus? What is going on with just grabbing people's bank accounts now? Um, 
uh, the fact is that when yeah, you know, there's so much speculation in a country and there's so much foreign capital going in that they want to basically try to take the money back from individuals who are on the ground. This this goes to whether you're a small depositor or whether you're um, in those situations slightly larger depositors. And it's the kind of thing that if you have a very destabilized global financial system is a serious concern for whether it's the United States or whether it's Cyprus or, or anywhere else. And it goes back to what we were saying before, that as long as you have accounts, normal, regular, you know, money in banks that is commingled in an institution that can also go about and create all sorts of, of havoc and do all sorts of speculation and take on all sorts of risk. The money on the table is the easiest place to go, unless, of course, the Fed is funding you, and then it's sort of a mutual uh, situation, and that's what, again, the Fed is, is doing as well. The Fed's balance sheet has grown by, by 10 times since before um, the financial crisis of 2008 to now. They now have you know a $2.6, $2.7 trillion size balance sheet of treasury bonds buying buying debt. The you know, treasury creates debt. The Fed takes it on their books. And um, more than $1.2 trillion of mortgage-backed securities. A few years ago, they, they didn't have any. Um, so they're basically continuing to subsidize um, the risk of the, of the system. But the other place to go to get the risk is your bank account. Is to, is to people's accounts. Uh, so so it's, it's really... What do you think of uh, Corzine not getting in trouble for MF Global now officially? Well, I, I, I knew that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, now, why not do it more? I mean, you know... They've, um, it, yeah, he, he's 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 in this um, mutual reinforcement society. Is that how they'll say. destroy the Ponzi scheme, though? Is they'll just go so far they destroy confidence? Um, that can help because you're, you're, you know, hopefully individuals will think twice before putting their money in something in Game of Global and actually looking at what the alliances are, the people that run these funds and that run these um, yeah, investment management companies and everything else and be a little bit more uh, you know, prudent about their own money. But it, it does take people getting more knowledgeable about who's running what they have and, and where they're putting their investments and, and not going into something like a John Corzine MF Global. It took less than a year and a half for that guy to wreck that company. Well, he was making, what, 40 to 1 bets with other people's money. I mean, what a lunatic. And, and, but in the case of, uh, of uh, like, Gerald Salente, he'd been, you know, had a gold brokerage account that had a private account. It's like a bank account, for those that don't know. He'd had that for 30-plus years. He didn't even know six months before. Nobody told him his that firm had been bought. So, I mean, how do you even... It's 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 hard. It's like you have to be vigilant all the time. If, if it's yours, you have to be... And not, not that Salenti isn't. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a very intelligent man. But 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 it, these things do happen in the night. You know, Chris Flowers, ex-Goldman person, you know, hires John Corzine, ex-Goldman person. You know, Corzine's bored. He's, he's done for a while with public office. And he goes in and he, he tanks this company and cordons off over a billion dollars in, in misappropriated funds to keep it going. I mean, had he kept... Was that really a theft, though? Anything? Maybe he didn't make 40 to 1 bet by accident who was it transferred to maybe it was on purpose maybe it was a bank robbery uh, well he is uh, some, some of it wound up getting returned but what, what it was was him making a bet of some sort that he that was wrong on in order for him like like you know a, a, a gambling addict at las vegas you're doubling down you're doubling you're, you're doubling down you're taking your grandma's money you're taking your kids money you're taking and, and and you're just trying to play and play and play until you hope you get out of it and he couldn't get out of it but because it wasn't his money um, because it was his client's money, in that respect, he was he was he was stealing from them in order to keep his. Why don't we give him a peace prize, <laughs> like Obama? Well, yeah, I mean, Bush <laughs> was just given a peace award. I think I think we ought to give him a uh, good spender, conscientious financial management <laughs> award. Uh, the, the, the press has been, you know... I better watch it. They may side. actually give him one, yeah. They're, they're happy. His, his friends have been on say he did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong. Yeah, so, so what? He made a bad bet and misappropriated... Because they all want to set the precedent to do whatever they want. They don't want to be looked at themselves. I mean, J.P. Morgan Chase had, had, had a lot of the trusts that were in charge of keeping that segregated money, and they allowed it to be unsegregated. He, he, here's what makes me ma out. maddest. Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, if you look, are the number one and number two biggest funders of shadow government. They fund the Bilderberg Group. They're yes. on record. Uh, you know, the, 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 they funded charity. Uh, they fund uh, the, the carbon taxes. They fund making you live in a 200 square foot apartment to actuary the taxes. But then they're all exempt. They don't want just all the money. They want to wreck everybody else. These are real scum. They want the power. At the top. Yeah, and I hate their guts. I mean, that's what I'm saying. They don't need to all be locked up. I'll, I'll say that right now. They're the ones that run it. They're the ones that pull the triggers. They're the ones that push the buttons. They're the ones that run the wars. These are the bad guys. Yeah, and 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 they control and they influence and they they have that power and and they they maintain it 
by their relationships with, with these institutions, with, with the federal government, with governments in other countries and so forth. They, they have the ability to manipulate the entire global financial and well, economic Well, people system. are always asking who's behind it, who's behind it. This is it. Every time I end, I end up digging into the deep, deepest rat hole, it, no matter what it is, it's the big six mega banks yes. and a bunch of degenerate royalty and just whose wealth is all uh, tied up. Their, 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 their wealth is, is partially in these banks. I mean, it is all connected. That's part of the reason I went and wrote this, uh, the book that I'm currently revising right now that'll be out next year. I wanted to go back. I, I believe that it is the private bankers running um, the government to a large extent, or at least in alliance with the government making the bigger decisions and that they work together to decide how they're... How and they're, they're all a up. bunch of arrogant SOBs. And, they, and many of them went to, to, to the schools together and again, Yana to go did everything together. They're, they're from the same backgrounds um, and they, they mutually enforce each other. And, and this has been happening... How arrogant, I mean, I see their arrogance on television and, and in their writings, but you know, the, you know the, I'm doing God's work, you know, like Jamie Dimon said. How arrogant are they in, per, uh, in person? I couldn't imagine being an evil jerk and then and then no one can can hold me accountable. They're, the ones I know, you know, the people I personally spend time with, like you know, like Lord Blankfein in his office. I, I, I they're just as arrogant um, in person as they come across on TV. If you watch them on TV and don't believe they're arrogant, you probably won't think they're arrogant in person. You know, tell a story. I mean, how how are they in person? Just? On you know, they, they they have the ability to. Um, uh, uh, you know, tiny little story. I'm, I'm, I'm with, you know, when I was working at Goldman and before Lloyd Blankfein was as high as he was, but he was, he was, he was running or co-running a division. Um, and basically there was a, a international trade going on and, and, and a fellow who was working with, um, well, a little higher than me, um, basically ran to Lloyd Blankfein's office while I was told to go the other way to get there and to basically talk about this trade. And Lloyd just had this ability to just shut down any conversation. You know, it was, it was almost like, you know, just shut down any conversation about any type of risk or anything that might be going on with this transaction. Just listen to what he uh, wanted to listen to, to you know, for the, the person that he wanted to, to hear the information from. And that's just, that's how power happens. You, you reinforce each other, whether it's, it's a uh, subordinate, whether it's a superior, you, 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 you reinforce the story along the way and you shut down um, any dissent or conversation on any other side of that. Um, and that's where your arrogance shows through. And then you act like you're doing one thing when you really know it's another. Everybody just plays dumb. Oh, gee, what are we doing? And you, you don't look under the rock a lot either. You, you feel you don't have to. If you're if you're high enough up, if you're a blank finder or diamond, you, you, you don't you don't know. You're not hanging out in in, in Stockton with. No, you know, no, you're like Hitler in the Wolf's Lair, going, "I could take down the Russians." You just don't care about. Or or, 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 or Napoleon. I, I no, nobody can beat me. And and it's it's been shown recently that they have been right. You know, by the fact that the, 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 the biggest bankers are still in charge of the biggest banks, which have grown. And so why shouldn't they start? Crisis. Why shouldn't they start taking your private bank accounts? Why shouldn't they take your pension funds? When they take the cops' pension funds, the cops will just go beat our brains out that much harder to get more money. They'll probably thank them. Everybody's destabilized, which is why, at the very least, these institutions need to be made smaller, need to be broken up. So at the very least, our deposits, our money isn't backing their risk. Real fast question from George in Connecticut. George, what? your question for Nomi Prince. Nomi, uh, I'm wondering uh, if we could take back the money in some form of state banks or uh, maybe re, re, uh, take, the, take a new bank that basically is in the Federal Reserve as their bank and uh, produce the money only yeah, for that's, Main Street. Yeah, let's skip this network break. We're going to the bottom of the hour and that's it. That's a great question. What are solutions? State banks, I mean, obviously, we try to go to credit unions, they just shut those down. I mean, but, but, but I think we have to make those choices. You know, where we put money, be before this big game of derivatives, before these banks were as big as they are, when they, when they were just slightly smaller but equally as powerful in, in, in a sort of less dangerous financial world, um, they tried to take over the smaller banks. And, and it's, it's up to sort of individuals to decide where... Um, where they keep their money to a large extent, whether that's state or local, even if credit unions are being bought up, it's 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 still a personal individual decision. Now, now it is sometimes hard to get out of the bigger banks if you have accounts with them, if you have a mortgage and it's attached to your credit card and everything else. So the way to start legging out, if there are certain elements that you have attached to a larger bank, um, is to start leg out of the smaller things. You know, to start putting you know, putting your savings if you have a savings account into uh, a smaller bank. Take a look at where rates are a little bit higher than the big banks. Don't even give you they they basically charge higher fees in the smaller banks or than the state banks. The state banks have been shown, you know, for example, in North Dakota, they've, they've been shown to be less 
risky with people's funds because they don't have the big government banking and they aren't involved in the derivatives. Plus, they're not as arrogant. They give you better interest rates, better service. They care about the local economy and about the state economy, and that means that your bank account actually matters more to where you live as well. So, it, 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 again, you're, I was talking about mutual enforcement at, at the big, powerful level. This is kind of a mutual enforcement at, at the smaller, more local, and more state level. Absolutely. You know, I've had a bank account with one of the big banks since I was in high school because that's what my parents set up for me. Plus, the idea is, well, if it's a bank all over, you can do stuff all over. But uh, over the years, we brought that down to almost nothing. Yeah. And then we just use it so when we go out of the country or something, you know, we have international bank, but there's basically no money in there. Right. And so I, I have a mortgage at a big bank. I've, I've had it for a long time. Um, I, I admit it. Um, but I don't really keep money there. Yeah, so it's not even like you have to do this right now. Just right. just, just, just set up a new bank account, yeah. start putting your paycheck in the local bank, and just move away from the big guy. Exactly. It's incredible. Let's uh, take another call. Lazarus in Florida. He'll be, he's going to be on a different subject. Thanks for holding Lazarus, and then Ernest, and uh, Mark in Scotland, and that'll be it. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Mr. Jones. Hey, bro. Um, I have information about the uh, these uh, secret uh, imprisonment camps. Oh, you mean the Emergency Centers Establishment Act or the uh, Civilian Inmate Labor Camp Program? Because those are public. I was uh, I was given five years. Uh, you know, I was young and I did stupid stuff, and I was given a, a sentence of five years. Uh, I ended up doing eight months uh, if I kept my mouth shut. Oh, wait a minute. So you were in the Civilian Inmate Labor Camp yes, Program. Because yes, if you sir. sign that, they usually cut it by two-thirds. Wow. And I, I, I want to get your name and number and talk to you off air. For those that don't know, it was a secret program to prime the pump for concentration camps in America that you can look up in the 80s it came out. It started under, under the Reagan administration. The Civilian Inmate Labor Camp Program. Clinton hit it in plain view in 97, declassified it. But it's where the Army runs it with state and federal prisoners, and these are real secret camps, but you go do work on them by waiving your rights. And they almost use them like Camp X-Ray in Guantanamo where they actually create jihadi terrorists. It's the other way around. They actually bring in criminals uh, or, or people to, in these camps to create clandestine operatives. This is a heavily classified area we're getting into right now. Sir, so, so hold on. What did you go to jail for? And tell us about the civilian inmate labor camp you were in. Uh, I was there. I, I was sentenced for grand theft auto, and like I said, I'm not proud of that. But uh, that's that's why I was put in there. Um, the they actually black bagged you to get you to this area, and I, I mean, I don't re really want to say where the area was online uh, on the air. Well, we know where the twelve original camps are. Well, this one was in Florida, so I don't know. If yeah, I know. Think. It's it's listed. Okay. It, I mean, well, I, was, uh, we, we, we've actually got it on screen for people. It's it's uh, but and they hide it in plain view like it's no big deal. Uh, go ahead, sir. Exactly. Um. They gave me eight months, and so you had to sign an agreement. See, this is what they're doing is to not make it completely illegal. You waive your rights under contract to go to a secret camp. On, and they put them on huge bases off on the corner. So, 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 sir, describe what you did at this camp. Basically, meaningless, meaningless uh, labor. Um, you know, they wouldn't give us weed whackers or anything. So, you know, just like in the... Uh, Yo-yos. Um, cool hand Luke, you got these uh, swing blades that you had to go out on the side of the road with. That's and a yo-yo, yeah. Yo. And uh, uh, fight fires, they made us do. Because um, it was a, a national state park that this was yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the, and they told you it was secret, right? They told us it was secret and that it was a state-run fund, yet all the tags on all the vehicles were government. And let me expand on this. Did you go work for private firms? No, sir. Well, I, I don't know. Again, I, I wasn't privy to that information. Yeah. Well, they first had 12 camps starting in the 80s. Like Wikipedia says it started in 97. Notice before he put that up, I said 97. 97 is when it was made official in the Federal Register. Uh, but, uh, well, you're lucky you weren't into some of the really nasty stuff, buddy. Because, uh, like, if you were involved in murder or something or something like that, you might have been recruited to be a government hitman.
Uh, and I mean, folks, this government is so out of control. If people even knew the stuff that was going on at these bases. So anything else you want to add about working at the, uh, I don't know why you're, it's not even that big of a uh, secret. I mean, uh, most of it's public. Uh, what particular uh, Florida uh, National Park were you on? This was in Jonathan Dickinson State Park. Oh, State Park, yeah. And not only that, but there were also underground bunkers for food, water, etc. throughout that park that uh, there were people working at full-time, and I'm talking full-time yeah. as in there no, were... I hear you. And this is all a test to create the infrastructure to prime the military to, to run real camps in the future, which they're now openly establishing. And the, and the new Army Manual 2010 says, for your re-education, you will be sent to these. Yeah, that's... Well, <laughs> you know, I got out easy on eight months, and... Uh, uh, yeah, I thought it was a blessing until I, you know, started, until I woke up and realized that, you know, this is much bigger than myself. No, no, you're just priming the pump. And they admitted that. That came out in the Miami Herald, actually, in, 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 in uh, 1986, was this was to condition the police and military. It was normal. See, it's all about brainwashing them. But now they're going, oh, by the way, now we're going to have political dissidents we black bag here. Everybody's like, well, it's secret. They agree to be here. No, no you don't. <laughs> I love it, man. This country's so loving. Thank you, Lazarus. You ought to uh, do a YouTube video about it and tell your story. God bless you. Uh, if you're a radio listener, we were putting all this on screen while we were talking. I don't make any of this up. Uh, let's talk to Mark in Scotland. You're on the air with Nomi Prince. Go ahead. How you doing, buddy? Good. Go ahead. Uh, hi there. Uh, just, well, I've got two questions for you. Um, one of them is, I would like to know generally how much this affects the whole of the UK as well as America. You're under the exact same program. The whole the the programs are all identical with just simple name variations in some cases in the Anglo-American Empire. That means all former Commonwealth countries and the United States are are under the same system. Yeah, I gathered that, but we, we we've not been having the drills like you guys. Um, but the second question we'll cover that is. I've been realizing there's a lot of Islam being brought to the UK over the last year and a half now. And I mean, I don't know if you've been reading the mm -hmm. newspaper with the um, Lee Ribby and whatnot. Yeah, no, that's part of the clash of civilizations that PNAC wrote about, where they're going to only fund the radical Muslims, bring in as many as possible, and then basically let them do whatever they want while setting up patsies. It's all part of the clash of civilizations that PNAC wrote about, and I appreciate your call. That's a good way to end. What do you make of the open funding of radical extremists and Al-Qaeda against Libya and Syria? Um, you know, I, it's not really my main topic, but, but, but you know, I'll, I'll say that, you know, going back to what we're talking about, the banks and in, in, in those areas, um, that in a lot of the nations where there is the most um, uh, clashes, um, they tend to be the areas that, and I, I just actually revised this chapter on the Cold War, um, the 1950s chapter, which is when a lot of these outposts actually happened and when um, Chase in particular um, set up outposts in the Middle East, National City Bank, which is now Citigroup a little bit less, um, and actually hightailed it to find places where they could create sort of financial service um, outpost. Sure, they love to destroy. Involved in, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in what was happening on the government side and, and, and therefore support where they thought they could make the most profit, where they thought they would be most protected by both the U.S. government and whatever government was in power in, in any of the countries. Sure. And it's just kind of continued um, since then. And this sure, bottom line, the people running our government love dictators and oppression. What do you think they want to do here in America? It doesn't matter what administration's in, they work for corporations that are totally cutthroat and criminal. And, and I don't know how it ends until we stand up and say we're not going to be slaves. But people think laying down is how you get through life. Yeah, I mean, you know, coming from, um, I'm, I'm not a particularly violent person, but I, I certainly am someone who believes, um, and part of the reason why I, I started writing books after I left was was to um, explain what I know of what's going on in, in my corner of it. Um, and to resist. That, to resist, to give information, to allow people to make their own decisions and, and hopefully take it from there. Um, because I believe that in order to be, if we're not informed, we can't resist. We need to know. Absolutely. We're going to talk more about that in the Obama deception, too. Naomi Prince, thank you so much for coming. Coming to Austin. All right, we'll go into retransmission now. Nightly News, 7 o'clock tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Nomi.
Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the InfoWars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happens. So check it out, InfoWars.com forward slash show.